The Disappearance of Rebecca Coriam from Disney Cruise Ship Wonder Rebecca Coriam was from the UK and she was working on a Disney cruise ship in March of 2011. When she went missing, they were somewhere off the coast of Mexico. In the last 20 years, there have been over 310 documented cases of people going missing from cruise ships, and only 10 have been conclusively resolved. This means there are about 300 unresolved cases with families unable to move forward. They need answers, and the industry itself isn't even legally required to make the cases public or even do the things that would help find them. Unfortunately, the press and social media is the only way that a lot of this gets out to the public, as allegedly the cruise industry tries really hard to keep it all hidden. At the time Rebecca disappeared, the Chester, England native was 24 years old, and she was employed in child care aboard the Disney cruise ship Wonder. The ship at that time was traveling from Puerto Vallarta, Mexico, to Los Angeles. And she was last captured on CCTV on the cruise ship on March 22, 2011, reportedly at 5.45 a.m. She was seen in the crew lounge talking on an internal phone line. She was wearing men's clothing and reportedly acting somewhat strangely. She's seen hanging up the phone, and this is the last time captured on footage. According to Disney, she went to the crew pool and was swept overboard even though there's no huge waves or bad weather at that time. And the crew pool is bordered by a six-foot wall. Rebecca was due to start work at 9 a.m. that day, but she didn't show up. Disney staff were alerted to search the ship for her, but didn't find her. The United Coast Guard and the Mexican Navy was then contacted, and they would end up doing a search surrounding the cruise ship. It would take years to come out, but it was strange just how ever-shifting the facts were in this case. According to Mike Coriam, Rebecca's father, Disney disregarded the standard operating procedures and they didn't turn the ship around to go look for her, despite this being a required procedure. And as a result, when the Navy and Coast Guard were called, they were given blatantly false coordinates, causing them to search the wrong sea. Under the flag of convenience system, the jurisdiction of the case would fall then to the country of the ship's registration, which in this case was the Bahamas. Three days after Rebecca disappeared, Disney finally contacted the Royal Bahamas Police in order to begin an investigation. Disney would then pay for a private jet, fly out one investigator from Los Angeles. The man spent one day on board the cruise ship once it returned to port, interviewing only six of the 950 employees on that ship, and they interviewed zero passengers. And there were, in fact, 2,000 passengers on board at the time Rebecca disappeared. Disney then flew out Rebecca's parents, Mike and Ann Coriam, to meet with the detective and the ship's captain. Her family would later state that everything appeared posed. They felt it was staged to the point that it was concerning. They were picked up in a car with blacked out windows and taken to the back deck while the passengers disembarked on front. They were taken into a room and final CCTV footage of Rebecca was played. The detective then provided his conclusion. He had concluded that Rebecca had been swept off the deck by a huge wave, despite the fact that the crew's swimming area is protected by a six-foot wall, and this was located on deck five but he believed that she was washed overboard. The proof to this was a single flip-flop that was left on board in that area, saying it belonged to Rebecca. Case closed. Dissatisfied with Disney's conclusion as to what happened to Rebecca, the Coriums hired a private investigator named Roy Ram, and he was a former specialist of Scotland Yard, and he actually offered his assistance for free. What they unearthed outside the official investigation had disturbing implications as to what might have actually happened to Rebecca. Disney continued to maintain that a rogue wave caught Rebecca off Deck 5, somewhere between the hours of 6 and 9 a.m. on March 22, 2011. However, the weather and ocean conditions near Puerto Vallarta during that time had no indication whatsoever of stormy weather. It's noted that the primary piece of physical evidence is the CCTV footage. It shows her talking on the internal phone during her last sighting. However, Ram retrospectively discovered the footage had been cropped 
will hide the true timestamp and location. The time that she was speaking on the phone as alleged as 5.45 a.m. was not. It actually took place at 2.45 a.m. They claim the footage was shot on Deck 5, near where Rebecca was allegedly swept overboard. After viewing the undoctored copy of the footage, Ram and the other investigators learned that it was actually shot on Deck 1. It wasn't even shot on Deck 5, where the shoe was found. And the shoe itself, it was huge. It likely did not belong to her. As we all know from wearing flip-flops, I mean, a huge one would be hard to keep on your foot as you walked. The investigator would point out it was super unlikely that that was her shoe in the first place. The remaining sandals had the name, actually, and a cabin number of somebody else. A few months after she disappeared, investigative journalist John Ronson of The Guardian sailed aboard the ship and he spoke with crew members in hopes of learning what really happened to Rebecca. One crew member made the ominous statement, Disney knows exactly what happened. He went on to explain that all of the internal calls, like the one that Rebecca had made, are recorded. Disney had access to exactly what she said on the phone. One said, I don't know anything about it. It didn't happen. You know, that's the answer I have to give. Another bizarre discovery was made after Rebecca's disappearance. The Corium family noticed that there had been activity on her bank account, as well as the password to her Facebook had been changed. It led investigators to believe that something had been deleted or changed after the fact, likely in order to hide what had really happened. According to the accounts of crew members, family, friends, and members of law enforcement who tried to piece it together, Rebecca's case was botched because Disney and their investigator went out of their way to avoid actually investigating. It was impossible to know what happened. With only six people interviewed, they allegedly went out of their way to withhold evidence. And of course, they did not mention that they had those phone calls recorded. It's impossible to know if they even accessed them. In 2016, Ram kept investigating, and he uncovered a ripped pair of shorts that were found within Rebecca's remaining personal effects that were found in her cabin. He and other law enforcement officers believe that possibly an SA happened in her room prior to going missing. Several of Rebecca's friends would come forward to say that she was concerned an assault would happen. It's not clear if anyone had threatened her or what was going on. The friend would say that he was never questioned, nor were any of her other friends on board. He would refer to the word investigation as being an insult. Chester Metropolitan Police Officer Chris Matheson made the statement, Whatever the circumstances, there is an obligation to investigate. It is very suspicious how far out of the way they went not to investigate and to allegedly hide evidence. The Disney Corporation has continued to insist she was swept overboard. Her parents eventually settled with Disney in 2015 for an undisclosed sum of money. The settlement included a non-disclosure clause, so they are unable to discuss the case further. In 2017, American Tracy Medley came forward to say that she was Rebecca Coriam's girlfriend. The two had been dating for a while when a man she also used to date, named Devin Hyde, who was a Honduran national and would sometimes work on board the ship. In the interview, Tracy would go on to say that she ended up dating both of them once they were all on board together. This was corroborated by another friend who had been on board at the time, who said that Rebecca felt she had to fight for Tracy's attention and felt forced into participating in a threesome in order to not lose Tracy and stay in the relationship. A friend would say later that Rebecca was very upset by her participation in the threesome and that she hadn't been with a man before saying as a result she felt distraught and traumatized. This too might explain why Rebecca was seen on the CCTV footage wearing men's clothing and looking distraught. Tracy Medley has gone on record saying that Rebecca went for a walk and never came back, and that she thinks she may have taken her own life. Rebecca's family, however, doesn't believe this, pointing to the fact that she paid for Disney tickets at Disney Paris for her entire family, and that they were all looking forward to the trip. A maritime expert and family friend would speak out, saying that it's believed somebody took her life. They seem to believe she was thrown overboard. Her family hasn't spoken out since the settlement, of course, though. And this was prior to the information about the threesome coming forward. The family would also point out that two friends came forward to say she had voiced fears of being attacked. In a way that I can't say on YouTube, but we'll just say S.A. 
she became fearful of an essay. Labor MP for Chester, Chris Matheson, told the Liverpool Echo, The more you look into this, the more it smells rotten. The more it smells like a crime has taken place. Disney, however, has stood by the results of their brief two-day investigation. This and the case of Amy Bradley and other cases like this highlight issue with possible crimes happening on board and the fact that there is likely very little protecting anyone if the priority is for the cruise ship to protect itself and its image. Even the way they register the cruise ships are done with purpose. They are generally registered under what's referred to as flags of convenience in small states like Panama, Libya, Bermuda. Under maritime law, it doesn't matter what area you are in when a crime happens. It only matters where the ship is registered. In this case, the Bahamas. And so that was who was in charge. In these cases, it's alleged that the investigator seems to be investigating from the position of helping the cruise ship. The investigators seem to receive a lot of perks like private jets, fancy hotel rooms. Additionally, fleet forces from the countries that they've chosen have different procedures and allegiances, and they may not be able to even afford to investigate a crime. All of this seems to benefit the cruise ship. It also doesn't help that by the time the investigators arrive, the ship may have removed or cleaned evidence or removed crew. Passengers may have disembarked. Again, the priority of the cruise ship seems to be to protect itself, which I understand to a degree, but we're talking about real people that are missing. Usually by the time help arrives, even if they want help, the recovery of finding the person would become impossible and evidence will no longer be accessible. Roy Ram assisted the Koreans for free, saying he was moved by Rebecca's story. He had a lot of experience in the area, and he wanted to use that to help the Koreans. He would go on to publicly state, I was aghast by the appalling quality of the investigation. I thought it was awful. There were so many things that didn't look right. To me, it was more about keeping the ship on schedule than it was about finding the truth about Rebecca. He would then go on to point out flaws in this case, such as an insufficient number of interviews the investigator conducted, the fact that there was zero forensic examination carried out. He would say that the most distressing thing was the changing of the timestamp, where she spoke on the phone at 2.45 a.m., and they cropped it to claim it was 6.45. As well, of course, is the fact that they record calls and it wasn't mentioned and no audio was produced. In fact, her possessions, such as her laptop, phone, none of it was taken or investigated at all. And of course, they claim the wave happened, but when the documented weather for that time shows it's impossible, that is a problem. Only six people were interviewed, he would say, and despite having access to everyone when the investigator first arrived, they chose to do no more than that. Then, of course, there's the ripped shorts that were found later. He would also note that CCTV footage is clear she wasn't even on the deck that they claimed she was on. The shoe they claimed proved she went overboard didn't belong to her. Her credit card was used months later, though no one knows by whom. And finally, there has never been an inquest at all to get to the bottom of it. He would go on to state that he believes it was a cover-up, that their goal was to cover up a PR nightmare for Disney, saying he believes that they just wanted to see it go away. A crew member commented that they don't want anything to happen that takes a smile off Mickey's face. Rebecca Coriam was 24 when she went missing in 2011. If she's still alive, she would be 35 years old today. Disappearance of Amy Lynn Bradley from Rhapsody of the Seas On March 21, 1998, the Bradley family would head from their home in Virginia to Curacao. This was a big deal for Amy. The 23-year-old woman had just graduated from Longwood University, and the trip was a gift to her for her graduation. The 21-year-old brother also attended, and they would all celebrate before she started her new computer consulting job. Amy had also adopted a dog from a local shelter, so things were just really starting to happen for her. On March 23, 1998, Amy went with her younger brother, Brad, to a party at the ship's nightclub that night. They were drinking and dancing with the band, which was Blue Orchid. One member of this band was named Alistair Douglas and he was known by the nickname of Yellow. 
He had taken a shine to Amy, and he was dancing with her a lot of the night. A professional photographer and videographer would capture the two dancing together and take photos of them. This is one of those things where they employ a photographer, they take pictures, they lay them out, and they try to get you to buy them. The man would later say that he did have those photos out, and no one purchased them, but they disappeared. Some of the video was released by the FBI of the two dancing together. The link to that video can be found in the description below. Alistair Douglas would say he left at 1 a.m. that night. One other item of note from that night, it's noted that a waiter paid a lot of undue attention to Amy. He would send her notes and try to engage in conversation. He also tried to get her to leave the boat in order to go ashore and go to the bar Carlos and Charlie's. Amy, however, declined to go along with the waiter. After an evening of dancing and partying, Brad got tired and he said he headed back to his room at about 3.15 a.m. The ship's door system would indicate he entered the cabin at 3.35. It would then indicate that Amy came in five minutes after. The siblings would then proceed to sit on the balcony and just chat for a while. But then Brad got tired and he decided to go in and go to bed. Ron Bradley, Amy's father, would wake up somewhere between 5.15 a.m. and 5.30 a.m. And Rod would notice that his daughter Amy was sitting in a lounge chair, still out on that deck. Although his view of her was restricted to the waist down, but he could tell that it was Amy. He would then fall back asleep and he would wake up at 6 a.m. again. But this time, Amy was missing and so were her cigarettes and her lighter. It's assumed that she went up to the deck to smoke, although this was unusual because Amy's typical behavior was never to go anywhere without saying where she was going, although, of course, she may not have wanted to wake up her parents. After checking in the area, her father then reported her missing immediately. He begged them to make a shipwide announcement to keep the 2,000 passengers on the ship until they were able to find her. The crew refused, saying it was too early to do this. The reason it was a concern was that the ship was about to reach shore and they were all set to disembark almost immediately. At 7.30 a.m., the majority of the passengers had disembarked from the ship. The only announcement was for Amy Bradley to go to the purser's desk. And even that announcement didn't happen right away. Most of the people were gone before the announcement ever happened. That first page for Amy would be noted at 7.50 a.m. The ship was not searched at all until 12.15 p.m. to 1 p.m. 45 minutes for that large of a ship is interesting, but it's easy to see why it was done so fast later. While the ship was prioritizing not letting anyone know that somebody was missing, two women later, who found out that they were on board when the girl went missing, came forward to say that they did see her. They reported that they saw Amy on the elevator that morning holding cigarettes and a lighter. Unfortunately, that wasn't relayed because nobody knew there was a problem. Amy's brother, Brad, would report that the bass player known as Yellow approached him to say that he was sorry about what happened to Amy. The family was suspicious, of course, because nobody knew other than security and the Bradleys that Amy was missing. The boat was purposely keeping it quiet. So then, of course, the question is, how did Yellow know? The Coast Guard would launch a four-day search, which would conclude on March 27, 1998. The Coast Guard would then make an assessment that Amy had either taken her own life or just accidentally fallen overboard. However, Amy Bradley was a really strong swimmer. There's no evidence of an accident or foul play. Officials would later claim they combed through all 10 decks all 999 rooms, and found nothing, saying they concluded she had to have jumped or fallen. It would later be disclosed this wasn't even true. Only a slight search was done. In fact, by the time they even bothered to start searching, most of the crew and passengers were gone, and they didn't go room to room and check at all. They would also tell the Bradleys they were not able to post a photo of Amy to see if anyone had seen her. So the Bradleys were out of options. They went ahead and got off the boat to search for Amy in Curacao. Unfortunately, they were unable to find any trace of her at all. So they would then hop on a plane, fly to the next stop, and then reboard the cruise ship. 
Well, those in charge of the cruise ship would tell the Bradleys that they searched every room. They would later admit to the FBI that they only searched public bathrooms and common areas. They looked nowhere else for her. A little bit later, two Canadian tourists would report to seeing Amy, although that report wasn't made until they were back in Canada where they lived. They would say they were staying on a beach known as Porto Marie in Curaçao. They were not only able to positively identify Amy and her tattoos, but they also positively identified Alistair Douglas. This is the man named Yellow who had been dancing with her that night. It's believed that he was hired on to be her handler. It's not clear exactly when he was fired from the cruise ship, but it seems to be while they didn't search for her, they were pretty quick to fire him, which is also kind of suspicious. And then Royal Caribbean Cruises sent lawyers to the Canadian tourists to discuss seeing them on the beach. It was lawyers that met with the divers at their home, and it was clear once the lawyers arrived that the goal was to discredit them and what they saw. The divers, however, maintained their story that they saw Amy walking with two men on the beach and that she was also trying to get their attention, which, of course, they didn't understand at the time although the reasons for that seem pretty clear now. A federal grand jury would eventually happen for this case, and the FBI would call the man that came forward to testify to the federal grand jury, and he reported to that jury that Amy and two men were walking toward him on the beach as he and his dive partner were collecting their equipment. Amy started moving directly toward him, the man, identified later as Alistair Douglas, would quickly step between Amy and Carmichael. He would report that the man gave Carmichael a menacing look. Shortly after this, Carmichael and his dive partner would decide to go into the beach bar that was there. Once he entered, he was able to see Amy and the two men again. He described Amy's tattoos, and he described seeing her watch. The watch was described as being similar to the one shown here. Amy's boyfriend had given her this watch, and she indeed had it with her on that day that she had disappeared. She had been wearing it. The information regarding the watch was never released to the media either. He described it without having any notice that she had even had a watch. So it looks pretty clear that he probably did see Amy. In addition to seeing her with yellow, he would then describe the third person as a European type with a ponytail. He would then state he was 100% positive he saw Amy that day at the close of his testimony. It's not even the only testimony tying Alistair to Amy. At the same federal grand jury, a female witness would testify she saw Amy with Alistair Douglas on the top deck of Rhapsody of the Seas minutes before she disappeared. She said that Amy had a camera with her, and it's believed that she went to the upper deck to take photographs of the Williamstead Canal. The woman would also say that when she saw Amy, she wasn't wearing shoes. And this is actually also consistent with the facts. All of Amy's shoes were still inside the cabin. The witness testified that she saw Alistair Douglas give Amy a drink that contained dark liquid. The same person saw Alistair Douglas leaving the upper deck alone, and she saw him exit in the glass elevator. Despite the eyewitness accounts, it was concluded there wasn't enough direct evidence to charge Alistair Douglas. It is surmised, however, that Amy was probably removed from the Rhapsody of the Seas by cargo doors and that she was probably put inside some sort of container or laundry cart. They've stated there's a service elevator from the upper deck where Amy was last seen, going straight down into the cargo area. A few clues appeared over the years and they seem pretty credible. However, there's no way to verify whether or not that they're real. But the possibly less credible, a 1998 cab driver came forward to say that a woman who looked like Amy came forward with an urgent request to use his phone right around the time that the boat docked. It's not clear if she was able to use one. He would say he remembered her tattoos. There are some concerns about the fact that she couldn't have worn shoes at the time. And he couldn't remember if she did or didn't have shoes, although not having them would probably stand out. Also, she would have been most certainly drugged and removed if she was removed. So it's pretty unlikely she would be able to jump into a cab at that time. During the fall of 1999, it came out that Amy had been found. The Bradley family received an email from Frank Jones Jr. He would state to the Bradleys that he was a Navy SEAL. 
And he would say that he has men who are also Navy SEALs that work with him. He said that because he found her, they would set up surveillance points in Columbia where she'd been spotted. He went on to claim that they had observed her in a dark green SUV driven by a captor with long blonde hair, saying it was a dangerous situation and they tried to save her, but they were forced to leave after a week, saying they were fired upon by the men guarding her. Jones would go on to describe what she looked like, describe her at tattoos, and say that he had spoken to her. And he used as further proof a lullaby that he said Amy told him that her mother once sang to her. And he had photos. They were photos of Amy on a beach with a blonde-haired man. Jones would then go on to say that if he was given $210,000, a rescue operation could be launched to save Amy. His accomplice, a woman named Marguerite, would call Iva Bradley, Amy's mother, and claim that she was watching Amy at a neighborhood pizza hut. Once the pictures were provided to the family, they were finally able to breathe again. This was the first time they really had hope. Iva Bradley later gave an interview saying, When I got the pictures, I knew Amy was okay, and it was just a matter of time. As a result, the Bradleys would send Frank Jones $24,000 from their own pockets, as well as $190,000 from a fund set up for Amy's search. Amy's father drained his retirement account in order to provide the other $24,000 in order to get his daughter back. Took every penny he had, but it would be worth it. All that mattered was getting Amy back home. In fact, Ron Bradley's employer even provided a private jet to sit on standby to go get Amy as soon as they could. They would find themselves sitting in a hotel room, just waiting. They sat in that hotel for a week, waiting for a call that never came. Turns out it was just a heartless scam. Jones did have men watching a house, but an ex-army man named Buckholtz, who wasn't even a part of it, who actually thought he was going to save somebody, put together that it was a lie based on what he was observing. And he also overheard Jones speak to the Bradleys, relaying information that he knew positively wasn't true. He would let them know the house that they were observing had a normal family inside. It turns out it was just a game of extortion. A man who previously was Army Special Forces named John O'Sank would later admit he was working with Jones. He told the authorities he wore a blonde wig and he posed as the kidnapper. He would admit that they set up photos by finding a woman who looked like Amy, who they even applied fake tattoos to. They paid her to pose on a Pensacola, Florida beach. Tim Buckholtz, the man who realized that it was a scam, called Iva Bradley 17 months later, telling her Frank Jones was officially being arrested. And he made sure that Iva was able to stand on those courthouse steps when they brought in the scammer. So she was standing there, watching him as he was sentenced to prison for fraud. But unfortunately, there's no punishment could ever reverse the pain or the trauma or the anguish that they felt because of what was done. They'd already suffered so much, all for profit. Jones only got five years in prison. His sentence was reduced because he paid the Bradleys the money back. It hardly seems fair, but at least they got their money back. Years later, a man would come forward to state that in 1999, he was a member of the U.S. Navy, and he went into a brothel where he saw a woman who recognized him as being American. Chief Petty Officer William Hefner would explain that he left the U.S. Chandler and went into the Stellaris Hotel in Willemstead. The Stellaris was located across the street from where cruise ships would dock. The Stellaris Hotel was owned by a businessman named John Dariani. The circle shown shows where it was located. However, it's not there anymore. But at the time, it was directly across the street from the old dock for cruise ships. When the currently used pier is full, to this day, cruise ships and other ships still go around to this old dock. It's alleged that this location was being run by Dariani as a brothel. And for that reason, it was known to the Navy and the Navy personnel put down an order that they were absolutely forbidden from going there. When William Hefner came forward, he would explain to the authorities that Amy realized he was an American and she told him she was desperate for help. She gave her full name as Amy Bradley, saying she was an American citizen and that she was being held against her will. The petty officer, however, chose to say nothing, 
saying he was a married man who had been forbidden from going there. He didn't want to get in trouble. And for that reason, he never told anyone. He would later say he feared for his career and marriage. And so he kept his mouth shut. And he didn't tell anyone of her plea until years later. He then saw her photo in People magazine in July of 2001, saying it was then that he realized exactly who he saw. And he did go to the police. By the time the authorities investigated, the rifle had been burned down. He passed several polygraph tests administered by the FBI, and he did participate in the federal grand jury that did take place in Virginia. His story has long been believed to be pretty credible. He also apologized to Iva Bradley. It looks like John Dariani was later arrested, but for nothing to do with the hotel. It appears the issue was arson. John Dariani, for his part, has long tried to portray himself as a valid businessman, but it's alleged that he has many shady dealings. There was another sighting on April 18, 2003, this time in the U.S. It's believed that Amy was seen at Pier 33, known as Fisherman's Wharf, in San Francisco, California. Two artist sketches were completed from this sighting by an FBI artist from Quantico, Virginia. The witness was able to provide additional information about Amy's handlers, saying they were watching a musician on the pier near the ticket area for Alcatraz. At one point, one of her handlers gave her foreign coins, which she dropped in the musician's case. The witnesses eventually identified the woman with these two men as Amy Bradley. The claim is that when Amy's handlers realized that Amy had been recognized, they grabbed her and they ran. As the handlers dragged her away, The witness would further state that she looked over her shoulder and looked pleadingly at them as she was taken away. At one point, she stumbled and fell to the ground. There was a theory that she might not be trafficked anymore and that she was instead being forced to be a mule for them, bringing illegal things into the U.S. But of course, no one knows. There's no proof of any of this. The FBI took this as a credible sighting, but they would also state that there were no cruise ships in the area on that day. The handlers were described as wearing matching Hawaiian shirts and cheap sunglasses. According to the witnesses, the FBI sketches are like photographs and that they're very accurate. The sketches were on the FBI website for about 10 years. More sightings were on the horizon in 2005. In early 2005, a woman named Judy Moore was in a Bridgetown Barbados department store bathroom. She would state that she saw Amy Bradley walk into the bathroom and three men were waiting outside for her. She could hear the men threatening her. She was positive it was Amy Bradley and she describes Amy's demeanor as being distraught. Amy gave her first name to Judy and she said that she's from Virginia, which of course Amy is. However, that was the limit of their exchange. The men outside came in and forced Amy to leave. Unlike a lot of the sightings, Judy reported this immediately to the authorities, and at that time, a composite sketch was made of the men and the woman. And because she was alarmed at what was going on, the police were involved, and there were two more sightings of Amy that day. She was seen walking on the sidewalk a block away from Broad Street, with four men completely surrounding her. The sketches you see here are the ones from that sighting. As alarming as all of these sightings have been, it would actually get worse and take a darker turn. In November of 2005, Amy's parents appeared on Dr. Phil. They would release photographs that had been sent to the Bradleys that appeared to show Amy on a website advertising for female escorts at a location on Margarita Island, Venezuela. It's not clear when the photos were posted. They were emailed to the FBI and Amy's parents. And this came from an organization that works to track women and children who are being trafficked. The resort that it was from was known as Affordable Adult Vacations, and that location was verified through the photographs of things seen in the background, so they know that's where she was. The forensic artist was able to locate a known defect on Amy's nose that can be spotted in the photographs they received, or at least this was their assessment. The same was said for the upper portion of her ear. It was decided that most likely it was Amy in the photograph. The last sighting of Amy took place in January of 2007. 
And that's another disturbing rabbit hole that I ended up falling into while I was doing research. Alfred Cotton and three additional men were seen having dinner at the Mill restaurant in Aruba. They were with a woman that's believed to be Amy Bradley. What's interesting about this, too, in addition to it being a new sighting, is that Alfred Cotton looks very much like the sketch made in San Francisco. I'm not sure what the specifics were as to how Amy's identification happened, but it appears that the FBI took this as a credible lead. While that recreation does look very much like Alfred Cotton, I have to be clear that he's never been charged in relation to Amy at all. Because it was, in fact, Cotton in the recreation and at the restaurant in Aruba, it opens up the question as to how he was involved in her situation and for how long. We do know that Alfred Cotton and his wife, Jennifer Lee Cotton, were residing in Florida and they would later be charged by the New York City DA for selling women through a business known as Tropical Adult Vacation. Now keep in mind, this is not the same outfit that the pictures showed up from, although it's a similar setup. He was involved with Tropical Adult Vacation from 2011 to 2015. The DA had traced the profits and they were going directly to the Cottons. They charged him with selling people like menu items to U.S. citizens. It appears the charge originated in New York because that is where the person who paid resides. According to the DA, they claimed to be providing the women with room and board. It's also believed that many of these women were not willing participants in what was going on. And over those years that they operated, they set up hundreds of trips to the Dominican Republic, advertising on Backpage to solicit customers. When they were in operation, they sent Paco, the man shown on the screen now, to pick up customers from the airport. And when the Cotton's home was raided, they found lots of money in Dominican currency, as well as 55 pounds of silver and gold bars. Their excuse was that the services they provided to U.S. citizens was legal in the Dominican Republic. D.A. Vance pointed out that many of these women were known to be employed against their will. The Cottons would then argue that if they were going to be charged, it should be in Florida. It's unclear exactly how that case was resolved. Cotton and his wife, however, are no strangers to being arrested. So we need to back up to 2007 in hopes of providing some kind of clarity. If Cotton was spotted with her in her last sighting then, it's not a stretch to suggest he was in this long before he got caught. The FBI drawings of what appears to be Alfred Cotton was done from the sighting in 2003, four years before she was spotted in Aruba. The possible photos of Amy that were sent to her family were advertising services of the same nature that the Cottons would then be arrested for. So while there's only ties to them and this venture from 2011 to 2015, it's not a huge stretch to think that they could be involved in something similar from years before. In this case, the photos were taken for sales through Affordable Adult Location, which was located just a few blocks away from Tropical Adult Vacations. As you can see here, it clearly takes place the Astoria Hotel in Boca Chica, as the railings are very identifiable. Those photographs showed up in 2005 but they could have been taken a year or more earlier. It appears Michael Hooper and Charles Blasco were the affordable adult vacation managers at the time. Whether they're at all depicted in the recreations that have been done, it's hard to say. So far, there's definitely been no positive ID. Alistair Douglas, who was also known as Yellow, has never been charged with anything and apparently claimed he has no idea what happened to Amy. It appears he was given a polygraph and he cleared it early on. It's noted that after the police decided to clear him, more evidence came forward to prove that the things he'd said weren't quite accurate. The police did say that they obtained video evidence of him dancing later on and it's indicated that the video itself directly contradicts statements that Yellow gave in his polygraph. As I pointed out before in other cases, polygraphs aren't overly accurate either. It's also very reliant on the experience of the person giving the test, and even then it's not always correct. That said, Alistair Douglas did pass the polygraph. There are some claims still that she either jumped or fell, 
although again, it's pointed out she was a strong swimmer, and of course, there have been many sightings. It's also worth noting that she had a lot going on that she had set up for when she came home. She had just graduated with a degree in physical education and had a new job. There's no indication she wanted to hurt herself. She had arranged to pick up her new dog from the shelter right after she returned home. Also, she purchased 15 rolls of film to take on the trip. She planned to make a collage when she got back. This, of course, makes the sighting of her on the deck right before she disappeared, holding a camera, make more sense, too. You should note, though, that there's no confirmation that her camera was found in her room, or at least that I could find, or that it was missing. Because the police seem to accept that sighting as reliable, my guess is that she did have the camera with her. I'd love to hear what you guys think. This is one of those cases that I always go back and look at long before I ever thought of even doing anything on YouTube. I personally think she's alive, or she was alive. But I would like to know what you guys think. The details in the sightings are a lot different than you usually see with cases. A jawbone eventually washed ashore in Aruba in 2010 which led authorities to believe it belonged to Natalie Holloway. I remember reading once that DNA testing ruled her out, but I don't know. According to what I'm finding here, they say that no DNA testing was ever done on the bones, which is actually pretty disturbing if it could be either of those people or somebody else. Even if it's unrelated, it just feels like that person should be identified, but it's not up to me. There's no explanation or reasoning that I could find behind choosing not to run the DNA on the jawbone. Although, of course, the motivation could be much like that of the cruise ship for not searching. Sometimes you don't want to know, so that people that go there don't worry that something bad might happen. The Bradley sued Royal Caribbean twice, alleging that she had been abducted, hidden, and forcibly removed. Both lawsuits were thrown out of a Florida court, with the judge stating that the Bradleys perpetrated a fraud on the court by concealing evidence that proves Amy Bradley was witnessed living freely in Curacao. Whatever that proof is, I'm not quite sure. It's actually kind of interesting the way the statements by Royal Caribbean sort of pivot. She was living freely. She took her own life or fell overboard. But regardless of all of this, the judge ruled in the cruise line's favor, and it appears the Bradleys were fined nearly $200,000. I can't confirm that the fine was upheld, so I'm not really sure what happened. But it appears that they've alleged that she's live and well, and authorities spent 1,300 hours working the case. And these hours were apparently the reason for the fine. The cruise line would later make a statement that they fully cooperated with authorities, saying, We're sorry, despite all these efforts to assist the Bradley family, they've apparently decided to direct their grief at the company by filing a lawsuit seeking financial damages. Amy Lynn Bradley was declared deceased on March 24, 2010, 12 years after she disappeared. Over the years, various rewards have been listed, including the FBI offering up to $25,000 and the Bradley family offering $50,000, with a request for her location. It appears as a reward of up to $250,000 for her safe return. I'm always kind of hesitant to put the rewards on here because sometimes they're a limited time. So I want to explain that I don't know for sure if any of these have expired. It looks like there's current rewards. I did most of the investigation for this case through FBI reports, some press articles, but so much of it came from the website amybradleyismissing.com. I'll provide the link in the description. This is an amazing site and it has even more than I've told you here. It's very detailed and it must have been put up by somebody who knows the Bradleys or one of the Bradleys. Please, if anyone has any information, call the number on the screen. My heart goes out to Amy and her family who loves her. Can't imagine what this has done to them for the last 25 years. Amy Bradley has been missing for 25 years. If she's still alive today, she'd be 48. As always, thank you so much for watching. The current goal for the channel is 20,000 subscribers. Please consider subscribing and hitting the bell so you don't miss new episodes. Thank you so much to everybody commenting, even with just an emoji. It really has made a big difference. Without it, there isn't a channel, so thank you guys so much. Take care of yourselves and each other.